I've been putting out YouTube videos, I've gotten some positive feedback on the recorded drum sound that I get here at home. In today's video, we will cover five tips to get a good recorded drum sound at home on a budget. We'll cover areas such as gear, recording techniques, and mixing techniques. The song that we'll be using for today's video is called Just a Second and it's written by Taylor Mills. I want to very much thank Drumeo for providing free drumless tracks that I was able to use for this video. And I also want to mention that the original performance on the Drumeo video was done by Todd Sukerman and it was a lot of fun to learn just a couple of the licks that Todd plays on this song and I hope that you all enjoy the song because it's a really good song. The first area that I'd like to cover is gear. You do not need the most expensive gear to get a good recorded drum sound at home. However, there are some important considerations that I'd like to go over. The first piece of gear you're going to need are good sounding drums. If you want a good sounding drum recording, you need to start with drums that sound good. And it shouldn't need to be mentioned, but you also need to know how to play your part and be able to execute it well so that it sounds good. So these are the drums. They're Pearl Session Custom, all maple, 24 inch kick drum, 13 inch rack tom, and 16 and 18 inch floor toms. Believe it or not, I picked these drums up used for $499. Um, I needed to put new heads on them and replace a few screws and clean them up and things like that. You don't need to have really good drums like this. Many of the modern drum sets are that are lower end are really well made and the key thing is you need good sounding drums. I'm very fortunate to have the Ludwig Black Beauty snare drum and over the years, I've been able to collect several really good cymbals. So you don't really need the most expensive drums. And if you're going to spend money, it's best to spend it on your cymbals and your snare drum. The next piece of gear you'll need, aside from a computer, you will need a computer, is an audio interface. And you'll need an audio interface that works with whatever operating system is on your computer and it works with your digital audio workstation. The important thing here for recording drums is you need at least four mic preamps and you need to have phantom power available on those preamps so that you can run condenser mics. I've been using for about 10 years this Focusrite 18i8 I got it when it first came out because I knew it was going to be supported in Linux. Um, this is a very nice piece of gear because it's got the four mic pre's, but in the back it has four additional balanced XLR inputs that it will take a line level signal. So you can add even more inputs to it. And there's even an optical input to get even more inputs. Another nice thing about this Focusrite 18i8 is that it stores a mix within it so that you can bring this to a gig and use the mic pre's for a gig. And I've been at gigs where there's only one or two uh, channels available in the mixing board for drums and I can have four mics go into this and I've got this stereo to mono cable and I can just use one um, slot on the mixing board at the gig. So this is a really great piece of gear. So the next piece of gear that you're going to need are some microphones. And in this microphone section I'd really like to thank Matt McGlynn from RecordingHacks.com for his 2012 article best drum overhead mics under $200. And based on that article, I chose AKG Perception 220 overhead microphones. You can see them up there behind me. These are the AKG Perception 220 mics that I'm using for the drum overheads. They're large diaphragm condensers. I've also seen it's pretty common for people to use small diaphragm condensers for overheads.
on the left on these mics you have the sure beta 52a that i'm using for the bass drum and the sm57 that i'm using for the snare drum and these two mics are dynamic mics and they don't require phantom power like the condensers do while we're here talking about microphones this is the sennheiser e604 and these are great little mics that you can clip on to a tom and the reason I'm showing them here is that you can get a three pack often at Sweetwater or Guitar Center for a good price. And these microphones work really well in that live situation I was describing earlier. So you can mic two toms, the snare drum and the bass drum, and then the cymbals just carry in a small club so you don't need overheads. So the minimum microphones that you need to record drums well are the two stereo overheads plus a bass drum mic. And I've heard some great recordings with only those three microphones. I've got the snare drum, the SM57, added in addition to that, and I'll talk about what that brings to the table in the mixing section. And a real piece of magic that really up-leveled my sound was adding a room mic. And for a room mic, I chose the AKG P420, which is really the same series as the condenser overheads that I have. It's another condenser, it's got two capsules, and it's allowed, it gives you an omnidirectional pattern, gives you multiple patterns that are all useful. Um, for room mics, I would suggest, you know, not everyone's rooms are big. I have one of the benefits I've got is I've got a pretty large basement, so I can have this mic pretty far away. Um, I would say that if you don't have a large room, you should experiment. There are a lot of good videos on YouTube. I've seen people get really good results with inexpensive microphones. You can have an SM57 up against a wall or SM57s or other really inexpensive mics just laying on the floor in your room and you can get a surprisingly good room sound. So we'll talk more about the magic of the compressed room mic later in the mixing section. But um, if you don't have a large room and you can't have a condenser like I'm showing far away, I would just say experiment and you can try some pretty inexpensive mics and I think you can get some great results. So in order to support the fifth microphone, I needed to add another preamp and the one that I chose was this ART tube preamp. It's very affordable and it's got this cool tube circuit and it's got this little knob here where you can activate the tube in different ways and color the sound in different ways. I use a percussion setting along with the room mic but I've also found that this is a really great preamp for recording vocals. When you put it on the vocal settings, it makes your voice sound really good. So the last thing that I'll recommend in terms of gear is don't get the cheapest stands and the cheapest cables and have a few extra cables lying around. If you've seen my 20 inch bass drum video, you'll notice that I have a silly counterweight hanging from the boom stand. Um, because the stand is a cheap stand and it doesn't fully support that microphone position. So don't go the cheapest when you're picking out your stands. The other thing is make sure you have a couple extra cables laying around because you'll never know. You may have a session, you have a short time window, and you want to record a song and you find that one of your cables is dead. You want to have a spare so that you don't lose a day or something like that in that situation. So we've talked about gear, now we're going to talk about microphone placement for getting a good drum recording. So right now I'm just going to talk about the position of this left condenser mic, the left overhead mic, over the snare drum. So it's directly over the snare drum. And if I take a tape measure here, it's I don't know if you can see that, it's 40 and a half inches over the snare drum. So 
basically this mic is picking up the snare drum, like the bloom of the snare drum, the this crash ride cymbal, hi-hats, this guy, and the rack tom, you know, it, and it gets, you know, it's getting a picture of the whole drum set. So here we have the right overhead, and this microphone is picking up the floor toms, it's picking up the ride cymbal, and it's picking up this crash cymbal, so it's like picking up the right, hat, right half of the set. Both of the microphones create a stereo picture of the drum set. If I do a quick measurement, I can see that this microphone is the same distance from the center of the snare drum as the left overhead microphone. And one thing that I'll mention is I'm not using the famous Glenn Johns configuration where you have the condenser on the right kind of facing sideways this way, looking at the hi-hat and everything. I have tested that configuration with these mics in this room. And I found that in that configuration, I'm just not getting enough of this crash symbol. Um, so I've had a lot, a much better luck with this configuration here. So here's the snare drum mic. It's a Shure SM57. And you can see it's pretty much pointed at the center of the drum, pretty standard. So the kick drum mic is a Beta 52A and it's inside the kick drum about three or four inches off of the batter head for punchiness. So here's a rear view of the kick drum mic where you can see inside the drum. You can see the the hole and I've got a felt strip across the resonant head. So in terms of room microphone placement, another thing that I'd like to mention is I did a lot of experimentation to come to the position where I'm placing the room mic. So I would encourage you to experiment. So the next important consideration for getting a good recorded drum sound at home is recording at the right levels. So I go through a process. You want to make sure that your audio is not clipping at all, but you are getting a healthy audio signal on each microphone. So what you'll see next is a sped up sequence that shows the process I go through to get the levels right on the Focusrite 18i8 and also on the ART uh, preamp that is servicing the room mic. So the next very important consideration for getting a good recorded drum sound at home involves looking at the phase relationships across all of your microphones. So now I'm going to show you how I look at the phases of all the recorded tracks and do any adjustments that may be necessary. There are several methods that you can use to do this. Uh, the first method is in your DAW on each track there is a phase button and you can just flip the phases as necessary. Like if you had two tracks that are opposing in phase you can flip one of them and have them line up better. The second method 
is there are various time delay plugins and plugins that automatically adjust the phase for you that you can use. And then the third way is you can just manually drag the tracks to line them up. And not everybody agrees with this. I've seen some prominent people on YouTube say not to do this. And I've also seen some well-known producers actually just do it. The other thing I'm going to mention is that when I start recording a track, before the song starts, I hit each drum once. And that allows you to have some very clean hits on each drum so that you can check the phase of each drum. So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to zoom in on the snare drum tracks. You can see on the screen where I've hit each drum and then the song starts. I'll just play a little bit so you can hear that. So there's the song starting. And I've got the room mic muted because it's quite a bit out of phase or delayed. Because it's 20 feet away, it should be delayed by 17.8 milliseconds or so. So I'm just going to zoom in here. All right, so here we are. And what we can see right off the bat, the first two drum tracks are the left overhead and right overhead. And these are already in phase. If we just look at the peaks and the valleys, here's peaks, valleys, etc. And the reason that these are already in phase is because we place the, those two microphones equidistant from the snare drum. And that's why we did that, is so that we got phase alignment right off the bat there and keep the stereo image centered. The track here, this is the snare track, and I'm sort of centered on it, and you can see that it's out of phase with the overheads. And I'm in Ardor, that's my DAW. Uh, the, all, everything I'm going to show you works in any DAW, but what I'm just going to do here is I'm going to grab those two overhead tracks, and I'm going to shift them over so that the phases are lining up a bit better. And I'm looking at the valleys out here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play, I'm going to undo that move, and I'm going to play it, and then I'm going to redo it and play it again. So I'm going to play it now before Now I'm going to redo it. I'm going to play again. And what I'm listening for is the snare body. And to me, I'm hearing more snare body now. Okay? And, you know, listening to it is key. We're doing this visually, but the key is that you listen to it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute the room, and I'm going to also drag the room track over here. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm just looking at the phases. And they're never going to be perfectly aligned you're just looking for rough alignment and that room is way far out and that's why I had it muted before if I undo that and play it I 
do it. That sounds the best to me. And I will also look at the bass drum, and if there are toms, you look at all of the tracks. But this is generally what I do. So in this next section, we're going to talk about mixing the different tracks that have now been recorded. And in the spirit of doing this all on a budget, I'm going to be using stock plugins or plugins that are very affordable in this example. So what I'm going to do now is just show you some basic EQ and panning that I do on the kick drum and overhead tracks. So if we bring up the mix here, solo the kick drum first, and I'll just show you very quickly, I've got a high pass filter at 44 hertz. I've got a boost at 60, which is the body of the bass drum. I've got a pretty big cut at 311 hertz. That's really boxiness. And then I've got a boost at 3.7 kilohertz, which is where the beat is hitting. So I'm going to turn the EQ off and just solo the kick drum without it and then bring it in. I'm going to bring it in. Out. And in. Okay. Next. I'm going to solo. So what I've done here, I've got the two overheads both panned 75-25 and I'd use the drummer's perspective and I've got both of those overheads going into this overhead bus really for convenience and I've got a similar EQ. Here I've got a, a high pass at 66 hertz. I've got a smaller cut of, for boxiness at 328 hertz. I've got a shelf at about 2400 hertz, just two and a half dB to highlight the cymbals and the hi-hat. There was an objectionable sound at about 3.2 kilohertz that I'm taking out. And then I've got a boost at 5.1 kilohertz, which was for the hi-hats. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to turn it off play now I'm going to bring it in you can really hear it take out the kick drum and highlight that shelf highlights the hi-hat Take it out again. Back in. Now I'm bringing in the kick drum. And this is the sound that you get with just the three microphones. So what I'm going to do now is show you the magic of what the room mic is adding. So you can see here I've got this room mic track and I'm going to solo it and crank it up really loud. But on this room mic I've got an EQ that's cutting out the low end at 120 hertz and it's got a gentle roll off at about 1700 hertz 
rolling off the symbols. And I'm not sure what these other things, it was probably just some objectionable and pleasant noises. And then I've got this compressor with a 9.9, .9, you know, 10 to 1 ratio here. And I'm just crushing it. So I'm just going to play this so you can hear what it sounds like in solo. And this is just a stock compressor that comes with the DAW. I'm sure your DAW has one. So it's just an over-the-top, completely compressed sound. It's beautifully disgusting. So now what I'll do, obviously uh, that's not the sound that we're going for here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to solo the drum bus. So now we've got the snare, kick, and the overheads, the other four mics. And I'm just going to blend this in to taste and to show you what it adds. So here's the dry sound of the other mics. So now I'm going to blend this in. Take it out. Bring it in. So you can hear it just adds some nice edge to it. and makes it sound like it has air. So if I were doing a normal drum recording with no song involved, I would stop here at these sort of steps. So now what I'm going to do is show you some of the additional things that I've done because we've got a song here and to make the drums mix well with the song. And I'll mention that all those other EQ moves and everything else were also done with the song playing. Um, I just showed you those in solo for clarity so it's, you could hear what's going on. What I'm going to do now is just show you some additional things. I'm just going to be playing the song. So we hit play. So one thing that I had to do is the bass drum was sounding just a little bit woolly to me like a little too boomy and flabby. So I added a expander, or otherwise known as a gate. So it's shortening up the bass drum sound. The other thing that I've done here is I've taken the kick and the snare, and I've got sends going to a snare kick bus, and that has an additional compressor on it. And I've got reverb, and we're sending that to reverb, and we're sending the room to reverb, to this snare kick reverb. So I'll very quickly, I'm just going to play it again and show you what that snare kick bus is adding. So I've got it muted now. I'm going to bring it in. Listen to the kick and snare. So finally, as I was listening to the song, I found that the toms were lacking in volume and in body. So what I've done here, if you look at the screen, 
is I've copied the left overhead and right overhead tracks to their own tracks and I've called those left overhead and right overhead rack and floors. They're panned the same way and I've muted any place where the toms are not playing. And I'm just going to play for you. What I'll do is I'll mute this tom bus thing that I've created and then I'll bring it in. The other thing I'll mention is I've got a kind of wild EQ on it. I'm taking all the high-end stuff out and I'm emphasizing the floor tom and the rack tom frequencies. So I'm just going to play this without it and then I'll bring it in. Solo this for a second. Just give you a sense of what you can do with the various tracks that you've recorded. And you don't need as many microphones. So if you've made it this far in the video, thank you very much for watching. Now I'm going to go through a summary of the things we talked about, and we're going to go out of the video with the song that I recorded for this video, the great song by Taylor Mills, Just a Second. So here's a summary of the things that we talked about, right? So you need to get good gear. Um, you don't have to get the most expensive gear, but you need gear that is well suited for the purpose. You need to consider microphone placement. You need to place the mics well. You need to look at the levels going in and make sure that you don't have any audio clipping. You need to look at the phase relationships of all the microphones and you're probably going to have to make some kind of a phase adjustment. And then finally, there's a bunch of different things that you're going to need to do to mix all the tracks that you've recorded together to get a good sound, especially if you're recording songs, there's a lot of considerations to get the drums to sound good with the rest of the instruments. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope that you got some value out of it. And I also hope that you enjoy this great song by Taylor Mills as we go out. Thank you very much for watching.
Did it. 